Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Anyways, uh, thank you for um, hanging in there. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, bee protection at the federal level, some of the things that EPA and USDA, I actually am a Rutgers University employee, uh, but I work for a program called IR4. Uh, we're the unknown secret. If you were at the organic session earlier this morning, I talked about IR4, what we do, how we do it. Uh, but I won't go through and repeat that, but the five second thing is we're here to facilitate the registration of safe and effective pest management technologies for specialty crops, fruits, vegetables, uh, and other minor uses. Uh, we deal a lot with the federal government, with EPA. We're national in, in, in nature, even though we're here at Rutgers. We have 25 research farms throughout the United States, uh, analytical labs. About 200 people work for the program nationally. Uh, myself, um, I, when, when Joe was putting this out there and, and I volunteered, I saw on the distribution list that I'd come by and say, hey, I could help out. The reason why I volunteered is uh, I just retired off of the uh, EPA's Federal uh, uh, Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee, and I've been a member of that committee for 12 years. And over the time, we, we had a lot, a lot, a lot of discussions about some of the things I'm going to go through. Uh, so again, that, that's why I'm here. That's why uh, I helped uh, volunteer to talk today. Um, well, you know, it's Chinese New Year, right? So in the spirit of Chinese New Year, I'm going to throw a Chinese proverb up there. A man who has bread has many problems, but a man who has none has but one. And that is so true. And as we go through this, I want you to remember that proverb because, I mean, a lot of things that we're doing today, we can do because of the, the greatness that what American agriculture has done in providing food to everyone. Um, okay, so the opening question, and I think the two previous speakers probably helped you able to answer this question, do pesticides kill bees? And the answer is yes, many pesticides kill bees. You know, we heard about insecticides, obviously they're developed to kill insects, bees are insects. We heard about fungicides, their effects, we heard about herbicides a little bit and, and uh, adjuvants, so yeah, pesticides kill bees. That's a, as my daughter would say, duh. Um, but if insecticides kill bees, and we all know that pollinators are extremely important to many, many crops, why does the US EPA allow pesticides to be used in agriculture? Right? Fundamental question. H hang in there with me, guys. Um, one of the reasons why is the benefits of using pesticides are to be considered when EPA makes their decisions. Um, you go to the store, I think most people are gonna buy this head of cabbage than that head of cabbage. Of course, I wouldn't have taken a pollinated crop, I would take a leafy crop, but you know, more or less that they're gonna buy the, the, the head of cabbage without the pest damage. Okay, so EPA is required to look at the risk and the benefits of a pesticide use, especially when it comes to pollinators. It's a little bit different when it comes to human health. But the, when it comes to pollinators, um, if the benefits outweigh the risk, they are allowed to make a decision, a risk assessment, and allow that use to be registered. It's a, it's a simple risk assessment process. And if you've taken this class or come to my lectures when I'm on campus, um, risk. Risk is hazard time exposure. So you can have something very hazardous, but if you're not exposed to it, it's not risk. Let me put it in a, in a little bit different perspective, okay? Again, bear with me. Let's talk about carbon monoxide, okay? We, you know, that's a toxic, odorous gas when your uh, engines run, so it comes off of gasoline, diesel, um, all there. Incomplete combustion causes carbon monoxide. Cars produce it, trucks, heaters, tools, cooking equipment. Last year, just as I was getting ready to give a lecture where I used this slide, the, the two days before this one, six people in a tenement in New York City died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Six people, okay? All right, so let's look at this. Again, hazard risk. How do we manage risk? Our homes have chimneys, right? 
uh, exhaust pipes on our cars, exhaust pipes on trucks. We're required carbon monoxide detectors. We, we're now required to have not only carbon monoxide detectors with batteries, but carbon monoxide detectors that are hardwired to each other. And the result of these activities, these and others, is there a reduced number of carbon monoxide poisonings in every year. Okay, fine, you, we all get that, right? Simple. But let's just say we're gonna eliminate hazards, okay? We are now going to ban cars, we're gonna ban heaters, we're gonna ban tools, and other items that produce carbon monoxide. Well, it, we won't have those deaths anymore, but we're definitely gonna have a totally different way of life, right? Someone said this morning about their, their drive down Route 30. We imagine walking down Route 30 this morning, but that's how we all would have got here. So, I mean, so we, we're seeing this day in and day, day out. We manage hazard by uh, reducing exposure. Okay, so here we go. Now let's get it back to, again, to pesticides. All right, so we know that pesticide kills bees. We all agreed on that one, right? How are we gonna manage risk? Additional data, look at things. Uh, Ryan talked about the organic silicates. That was the first time I ever heard that one. Boy, get that in the hands of Bayer, Syngenta, uh, other companies that make pesticides that are having bee problems. Maybe they can change their formulations and remove that out there. Maybe they're reducing some of the risk. Modify the registration directions. Result, a, a reduced number of bee kills. Or we could do is go out there and ban pesticides. And some folks are calling for that one. Guess what? A different way of life. Remember that cabbage again? That could be one of the outcomes there. All right, so let's now really switch to some of the things that are going on. Um, you've heard this number before, greater than 30% annually, the, the loss of colonies. By the way, I, I don't know, uh, Ken, when, when the numbers will come out for 2015, 16 winter. But some of the predictions I heard is that number is supposed to go up significantly higher this year. So that baseline 30 may be up, what, 40, 50 percent? Yeah. Uh, and you know why everyone said it is? Well, at least what I heard, varroa mites, that there were such high populations of varroa mites out there that they really anticipated this was going to be a bad winter. Um, okay, so, but some beekeepers, environmental groups are blaming neonicotinoid uh, insecticides for the problem. Um, we saw both the two previous speakers, it's a complex issue. It's not like you can go out and say, you're the problem, get rid of you, let's go. I, I remember early on when colony collapse disorder first came out there, they were talking about cell phones. Anyone remember that? That cell phones were disrupting the flight pattern and was causing it? Again, you know, let's ban cell phones and we'll solve the problem. It's not that easy. Um, Europe issued a moratorium on neonicotinoid use, okay? That they said, hey, you know what? We're going to take it off the market. Let's, let's see what we can do. Their numbers haven't changed. They're still having the same type of bee kills they had there before. That's telling me that it's not as cut and dry of saying it's the neonicotinoids are the smoking gun. Okay, so where did we go from there with EPA? Well, EPA, when they first saw this one, and they still st start seeing problems, they came out with what was called the bee box. And um, has anyone seen this before? Okay. Um, in a very short order, when, when this whole issue about the neonicotinoids first came to bear, EPA came out with some directions and they asked the registrants, they didn't ask the registrants, they demanded the registrants come in there and change their registrations very rapidly and come out there and put this warning box on all pesticide labels that have these products to, to really inform the farmer and user what they need to do to protect pollinators. I mean, some of this stuff was pretty, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to say uh, uh, no-brainers, but you know, you're not, you don't want to be spraying pesticides directly to the bees. Um, just a little sidebar, Ryan mentioned in his presentation about the bumblebees being killed by 
pesticides. Uh, uh, that actually was an incident out in Oregon. Uh, I actually know the investigator out in Oregon real well. And the problem was it wasn't a labeled use of a chemical. It specifically said on that chemical, do not apply to flowering linden trees. That application was made to a linden tree which is in flower. Those of you who know bees know that bees love linden trees. Um, you know, it, it, it started the ball rolling, but it was an illegal use. Um, so here, in, and I'm, again, I'm not plowing new ground here. There are many factors that are leading to the hive damage. You've heard about public enemy number one, varroa mites. Uh, I think most of, you know, a lot, I shouldn't say most, but many of the experts are saying is these guys are the biggest problems. And, and just a plug for my organization, uh, we've been probably the largest single organization to provide materials to manage varroa mites. And we just had one new registration last year of hop beta acid called HopGuard to control varroa mites and a lot of the other materials such as uh, uh, meth mill and thymol uh, has all been through my organization. So we continue to work on materials and get them registered to control varroa mites. Diseases, you've heard about that one. The artificial diet, you know, you know, being fed non uh, not uh, sugar, or, or what is it, not uh, fructose corn syrup or high fructose corn syrup. You know that stuff they use in Coca-Cola that all the health experts are saying is, hey, you got to go back to real sugar because this high fructose corn syrup isn't the best thing to use? That's some of the artificial diets. Um, and I like to call it beekeeper abuse. And if there's a beekeeper in here, I apologize because I'm looking at some, some of the ones there. But these guys, these bees, are moved from Florida to California. They're on these trucks that tend to tip over quite a while. I've seen them go down the highway. They're going zoom, zoom. Uh, it's incredible what, what you know, some of the abuse that some of the hives go through. But you know, it all affects it. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's been a lot of focus on dust from treated seed. And I think that if there's anything with the pesticides, especially the neonicotinoids, that may be the smoking gun. There's not much out there at that point. Um, this is the way Canada is regulating it. They're really focusing on removing the dust from treated seed. And, and I was just mentioning to Ryan during the break here that one of the ideas that we've had is why not put a repellent on that seed coating so then the bees could go out there and they would be repelled against picking up that seed dust. So it's just an idea that you know we've been talking about. And there are some repellents out there that that people are working on that, that push it away. But I guess, I guess I'll just wrap it up with just two more points. You have some non-government uh, officials or organizations, activisms, and they've been extremely active on, on this particular issue of really just going out there and ensuring that um, you know EPA needs to be protecting the pollinators as best as possible. And that really has led to something that I find extremely scary is we have moved away from science and we've moved to emotionalism. And science no longer takes the precedence. It's the emotionalism that's affected by um, individuals of saying is, you know, we can't allow this to happen. And then we become absolutes. So let's go, let's go there. Um, so with all this going on, then President Obama um, felt he had to do something. Uh, he called me up and told me that, by the way. Joke. <laughs> uh, he, he, President Obama felt he had to do something. So he convened a White House task force. And the White House task force was supposed to bring in some of the best experts in the country to come in there and talk about certain things to do. One of the outcomes of this task force is EPA came out with a proposal, I think it was the last March or so, but in this proposal that basically said if there's commercial pollinated services used for crops, 76 pesticides that are considered highly toxic to bees are not allowed to be used for foliar applications when bees are present. Okay? It's, this is a profound proposal here, extremely profound proposal because my friends at EPA 
my scientist friends that I've respected for all these years because they've looked at science and they've made assessments based on the hazard times exposure, threw that out the window and went with a hazard standard. Basically said, if uh, highly toxic, and they define it, I think it was 26 milligrams per B weight, or whatever the case may be, whatever the number was, they basically said if it was over that standard, it doesn't matter how much the bees are exposed to it, it's gone. And guess what? It wasn't just neonicotinoids, and it wasn't just OPs. It was biopesticides. Biopesticides are used in organic agriculture. So it wasn't just going to affect one people, it was going to affect all of production agriculture. And needless to say, this was opposed by many, many with many different types of comments. Some of the NGOs, the activists, felt that EPA didn't go far enough, and they came in there complaining. They said it should be not just for commercial pollinated services, they said it should be for every application. Um, other groups, agriculture related, came in there and said, wait a minute, this country, pesticide regulatory systems are based on risk assessment. You've now moved to a hazard-based assessment. Uh, you need to have some degree of discussions about it because this is wrong. So this now, there, there were about 13,000 comments received on it. Um, the comment period ended uh, late last year. EPA is going through it now. We'll see how they come out and how they'll respond to this one. But if they take this and, and uh, apply it as proposed, it is not a good thing for agriculture. It is incredibly bad for agriculture. Um, I guess one part of a good thing, and, may, and maybe my friends that believe in risk assessments at EPA uh, got a little power back, but back in January, January this year, EPA released a preliminary risk assessment for imidacorporate. And in this preliminary risk assessment, they set a level, 25 parts per billion, where honeybee, and they said honeybee colonies can tolerate being exposed for imidacorporate for extended periods of time with no effects. Um, the good part in most production systems, bees aren't likely to en encounter amounts of imidacorporate which come close to posing this threat. Furthermore, EPA found whether spraying, applying the soil, or treating the seeds, imidacorporate did not pose risk to honeybee colonies in crops like corn, potatoes, tomatoes, cabbage, broccoli, and berries. Um, they need more information on soybeans, sto stone fruit, melons, and tree nuts. They did conclude that the use on citrus in cotton uh, might pose a risk. What's interesting to bring about in this point is anyone heard of HGB, citrus greening? Okay, a lot of nodding in the head. Citrus greening is a devastating disease that essentially is killing off the Florida citrus industry. It's now, not the H, H, HLB, excuse me, now it's not in California yet, but the insect that transmits it is in California. It's bound to be there anytime soon. Their tool to control this is imidacorporate. So they're basically saying is, let's balance out whether or not we want to have a citrus industry in the United States or not. Okay, so beyond neonics, um, Earth Justice, uh, the environmental group, filed a lawsuit against EPA's registration of Sofoxifer. Sofoxifer is a new generation of material, it's not a neonicotinoid. It's a new mode of action. Uh, extremely safe to humans. Extremely safe to environment. Has a lot of registrations globally across the world. It's registered in many countries already outside the U.S. Um, EPA was sued in the ninth, ninth District Court of Appeals in California because they did not adequately document how they ran a pollinator risk assessment. Um, I was sitting across the table from the uh, director of the Ec uh, Ecological Fates Division of the EPA, and he said is, I screwed up. We did not document what we did good. But what we did say is the science is good. This is not going to pose a problem to, to honeybees. Part of the problem is they didn't put the paperwork. 
together, the courts did not give EPA an opportunity to fix it. And guess what? We lost a new compound that has tremendous potential to take our safe food supply safety and they threw it out the window. What's more disturbing is it's forcing, it's taking a tool off the potential shelf for the growers and forcing them to use older, more damaging materials for pollinators, more damaging materials for the environment. It, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense of taking this approach. They're doing the same thing with a new material, Savanto, which is a new, another new insecticide that has run the state of the art exposure studies for honeybees. It's shown up safe, but uh, the non-GOs are going after it. And by the way, I, I wish I was making this up. When these have come out there, they've sent out notices. We won, we beat EPA, the courts ruled in our favor. Please donate another $25 so we can continue to do it. It's a business, folks, and don't kid yourself. They're in business to you know, keep their, their employees going. And it, it's so sad because they're forgetting that, that guy that doesn't have bread. So you can't see this well, but I think you've heard of the precautionary principle. But this is a perfect, perfect example, you know. <laughs> this sign has sharp edges. Again, duh. You know, um, you know, but I'm sorry, I just wear a belt. I don't wear belts and suspenders, you know. It, it, we, we, we're losing it. So, okay, so what, what are our challenges ahead? Well, I, and I had this before, but, you know, I mentioned before about the bread and not bread, but, you know, as a society, we're rejecting technology before it has an opportunity to, to go out there. These studies are being done. There's more studies done on a pesticide than are, than are required to be done on a pharmaceutical. But all of a sudden, you know, activists come in there and they say, no, we don't want it, we reject it. And, you know, that's fine. I, I mean, I have no problem if someone says, I don't want to eat a, um, you know, some cereal that's made from genetically modified grain. And, you know, maybe the labeling laws will take care of that if that ever goes through. Give the people their choice. But the point fact of the matter is we have a challenge there. I, every presentation I throw this slide in there just to remind people that, you know, in a very short period of time, we're going to have 9 billion mouths to feed on this earth. If we don't do something and get our act together and recognize the importance of what we do and being sensible about it, and making decisions that are the best for society, you know, respecting the bees, respecting, you know, every group, but, but also making sure that there is enough food for the nine billion people there, we're doomed for a pretty tough time. So in that sobering thought, I think I'll uh, wrap it up. I'll, get, well, then I'll just say thank you.